Okay, y'all grab a cup of coffee or juice and uh, we'll get started. I should have mentioned earlier, uh, restrooms are down the hall this way. There's also some up near the uh, fellowship hall. And if you haven't looked over at the table over to my right, there is um, information from various organizations. There's also some postcards you can sign to our U.S. senators, uh, encouraging them to look at uh, issues of carbon. Uh, but take things off that table that interest you. If you want to uh, sign a postcard, please do. Back there where those green baskets are. If you hear something or want to follow up uh, by getting a copy of a presentation, uh, my email is at the bottom of your schedule, lksmith at usgbc.org. And you can just email me and say, I want this one, or I'd, I'd really like to have uh, the contact information for someone I met. I'm glad to, to make those connections. So this is the session on greening your church or nonprofit. Uh, I'm gonna address both as we go through. Most of you know me, uh, and this is an engineering heavy presentation, so lots of data. Um, I'm Linda Smith, I'm a chemical engineer, although I do very little of that anymore. I, I know how to do it, I guess I could if I had to. Uh, and Mac Mayfield is also with me. Mac's a civil engineer. That is not a picture of him. Maybe in his younger days. Uh, uh, Mac worked many years uh, uh, in heating, uh, air conditioning, and controls. So what we're gonna do today is talk about specific areas of interest that you can take um, for your church or your nonprofit and apply those. They tend to follow the sections of the drawdown book very nicely. Uh, but more than anything, uh, what I have found uh, in my work with my own church, uh, Second Presbyterian in Little Rock, with other, uh, I've been on several building committees. When they know you can read a set of plans, you tend to get on a lot of building committees. So I've done that. Uh, and what I've seen is those that are, are really practical. Uh, and so the things I'll talk today are, are proven. They tend to be best practices and they're appropriate for any size. You don't have to be a, a 2000 member church. You can be a, a little church. And in fact, it's probably more important with a little church or a little nonprofit because every dollar that you spend in utility costs and waste costs is a dollar that detracts from your stewardship budget or your outreach budget or even keeping the doors open. Um, I'm a Presbyterian and what I see is the decline in mainstream churches and so um, I've been a part of and my family is a part of now uh, closing churches and it, it's such a sad situation and it usually comes down to we don't have enough to turn the lights on and air condition the building. And so many of the things we're gonna talk about today are related to that. So the first thing uh, to do is really to make uh, the energy and water savings, the reductions in waste a part of your mission. You need to talk about it like it's a part of your mission. You need to use language that resonates. Maybe that's biblical language. Maybe that's the mission of your nonprofit. Um, if you have a board of deacons or elders or your board of directors for your nonprofit, they need to understand the importance of the energy and water savings as a practice to build up the other areas of the budget programming and how those two can intersect and really play nicely together to attract more members, to attract uh, the kinds of people that are activists to be involved in your organization or church. Um, and I say church, temple, faith community, uh, that's my, my lingo. I hope that can be your lingo too, whatever. I'm really talking about greening the spaces that are important to you, whether that's your children's school or your nonprofit office, maybe your personal office, your home, uh, but really today focusing on those church buildings. And so um, you need to have five people. 
You can't do it with one. One person cannot do this at your, your church or your nonprofit. You need to have five, and one of those has to be the keeper of the budget. Uh, could be your church treasurer, your organization's treasurer, if you have staff, whoever knows enough to when someone asks, what was our electrical bill last month? You need someone with access to that kind of data. So the person, a business manager uh, that's most involved needs to be one of the five. Even if they don't believe it and they think all that environmental stuff is a little wacko, you need that person as one of your five key champions. There'll be enough environmentalists uh, to carry the weight, but that person is the keeper of the data uh, in many cases. If you have a facilities guy, a facilities manager on site, whether that's a volunteer through a property ministry or uh, a paid staff member, that person also needs to at least sit in on some of the activities that we're going to talk about because they will understand, oh, that's really how we operate the building. And so I hope that these are things that are important to you. Um, you need to have your green team, whoever that team is, the five or more, more would be great, but at least five, um, that they are elevated uh, either directly or by affirmation from your senior pastor uh, or senior leader, senior board member, that this is important. And someone from the top needs to say, we have a new committee, or we have a committee that's going to take on some new activities, and I fully endorse them. So if your senior pastor or your, your board chair is um, willing to step out, that's really a good start. Uh, without it, people are going to say, oh, yeah, we'll let them do their little thing over in the corner, but, but that's not real important. And so really that affirmation from the top is key. And then there are behavioral changes that are cheap. Cheap, you know, turning off a light is cheap, but um, sometimes really requires some motivation. And part of that motivation may be the whole campaign. It may be the coming together of the like-minded folks. Um, many denominations already have some programs to help you with this, maybe through literature, study guides, or audits. Uh, I've put quite a few up here. I know I've been working with, you know, the Methodists, the Presbyterian, and the Catholics in Arkansas already. Uh, those have very established national programs, uh, but they also have folks uh, in their statewide uh, organizations that are helping with that too. Interfaith Power and Light is a, quite the resource for this in Arkansas. All right, so the next step after you have really identified your five champions and you're ready to move on is to perform some kind of self-assessment. Um, these are out there in good form. I've listed the one that I'm most familiar with because I helped uh, both uh, develop it and I've also used it uh, with the, the National Presbyterian with the, my own church at Second Presbyterian. And so I've listed it here. Uh, if you want more, I can show you that. It's an Excel spreadsheet, as every engineer would develop. And it takes you through counting light bulbs, uh, the kinds of light bulbs in every room, uh, the kinds of numbers of toilets, uh, how many times did someone in a sermon mention environmentalism. Uh, can you encourage more of that by having a quarterly uh, passage uh, in your uh, liturgy? Um, are there bulletin boards? Are there Sunday school lessons? Are there Bible school activities? All of this, it's a checklist. Yes or no, we're doing it. We're doing it mildly. We could do it uh, more aggressively. So uh, that kind of self-assessment is important. Again, it's an Excel spreadsheet. It's available for download. You don't have to be Presbyterian to use it. Uh, it's a good one, but there are similar uh, tools like that out there right now. This is kind of your starting point to benchmark where you are. You need to know where you are to start, and you'll see that in many of the slides coming up, so that you know where you are and then where you're going. Um, and I encourage you to use tools like that. 
if you took one Saturday and you had your business manager with access to their, their laptop that day, you could get this done in about eight hours of walking around your church. Um, it's a very good tool. Uh, we did it with our whole property minister ministry at Second Presbyterian, which is about 10 people. Uh, and we did it over a series of weeks, but if you'd it about eight hours of time to complete something like this. And it really does lead you to, okay, that's good. Now what's next? And that's some of the things we're going to talk about. Oh, uh, and to identify those top action areas, I put these slides up. Um, they are my own church and because they helped us identify, we have very tall ceilings in the sanctuary. We can barely build a structure. We can't get there to, with a ladder to change the lights. We have to, we can't get there with a lift in the church. We have to build a structure when a light bulb goes out to change one. As a result, we had light bulbs out all the time. It looked kind of weird. Um, and it was dangerous. It was dangerous for whoever had to get up there to try to do this. Uh, the church was designed um, 50 years ago, uh, and it is beautiful, but you can't change the lights. So we really knew um, that lighting was important in the sanctuary, and if we could get longer live uh, bulbs in there, that would be an action area. So we were looking towards both lighting controls um, for dimming in the church, but also lighting controls that would reduce the time between light bulb changes. And then the bottom picture is our outdoor lighting. If you drive by 430 uh, and uh, Pleasant Valley Drive in Cantrell, you'll see our lights on. Uh, but we, we knew we wanted to participate more in dark sky. We had some neighborhood complaints about lights shining the wrong way. And so we looked at how do we change our lighting outside and both of those became two of our first areas, indoor lighting and exterior lighting. And so the education I mentioned before is an important and crucial part of what you're going to do to educate uh, from the young to the old and incorporate that in lesson planning, in book studies, uh, in uh, inserts in the newsletter, our church, every uh, newsletter and every bulletin for one year for, for 52 weeks had a paragraph insert that was a hint about saving energy or saving water or did you know. They got those off of the internet. It didn't take a lot of time, but there was one every Sunday for 52 weeks. Uh, so I think that's good, frequent, regular, uh, compelling, something that really catches the eye and the interest. So I hope you can think of those. I really like this picture of this big ball rolling the earth down the street. This is a Bible school in Kentucky uh, that bought this ball and would roll it down their neighborhood street to talk about what the youth were doing. Uh, I think that's a very visible uh, form of what education can be about. And so now Mac's gonna come up for a while and talk about his part, which is all energy, and then I'm gonna come back and talk about waste. Having an energy audit is a very uh, basic way to find out how you're doing in your building and look for opportunities to save energy and as a result, carbon. Um, in our area in Northwest Arkansas, we have a couple of investor owned utilities that will do the audits for free because those customers pay on every bill a little, a very small fee and that's to support that service. So in Northwest Arkansas, that's um, Southwest Energy or SWEPCO for electricity and Black Hills for natural gas. Uh, many people have natural gas from Black Hills but are getting their electricity through a co-op. Uh, I do believe that the people who do the audits and the name of that company is Clear Result will also do electricity in those cases if they have a gas customer. So that's, that's, one, that's one opportunity to bring to your building a uh, professional outlook on HVAC and lights and, and to look for opportunities to save money and get fairly quick paybacks. 
the co-ops uh, run some programs as well for residential, but they're not very aggressive in the commercial market at this point. Although they're, they're certainly glad to talk to you and guide you in some ways that may be beneficial. Now, I used to do energy audits uh, in a previous life. And the things that really helped me out were if the owner was able to find their plans and specifications and have those uh, laid out. Oftentimes in, in churches, the, the buildings are, uh, have been built over a period of time in several different phases. Having those uh, plans from, from the history, over the history of the building can be very, very helpful and, and greatly reduce the time it takes to uh, perform a good audit. The other thing that's very useful are utility bills. Having those at the ready um, makes it easy to do a desktop audit using tools like the EPA's Portfolio Manager. Uh, it's easy to see where a building ranks in terms of uh, its use and, and uh, climate, how it compares to its peers, which uh, illustrates room for improvement or, or, or a pat on the back, depending on how the building is doing. And as they say, you can't manage what you don't measure. And that's the basic measure would be the kilowatt hours and the therms. Um, lighting and HVAC typically make up the largest portions of the uh, audits. So having uh, any layout of that is helpful. A lot of that is controlled by human behavior and just being able to turn the light switch off and only run the HVAC when necessary can also be very, very useful and save carbon and, and save people money. Um, the auditor should be familiar with all the utility incentives that are available above and beyond getting an audit done. The um, review of the building should uh, come to light. Things that should come to light are the uh, opportunities to get financial incentives through state programs. Um, clear result it runs those for our investor owned utilities and they can be quite substantial and reduce the paybacks for uh, lights, uh, upgrades in um, upgrades in HVAC. And in the next section, we're going to the next session, we're going to talk about that extensively. Moving on to management would like to speak to the a major issue for certainly for all of our buildings that have air conditioning and that is managing refrigerants. Uh, it's very, very important because it has a big effect on climate. As a matter of fact, I have a quiz and this is from the book uh, Drawdown. And I wanna encourage everybody to look at that website and check it out. It is really compelling and very thorough. So they've ranked the top 100 activities that we have to undertake to get a handle on carbon. And so here's the question. Rank the following activities for carbon drawdown potential by the year 2050. And I'll give you four choices. Household recycling, replacing petroleum as a feedstock for plastics. Uh, so essentially creating uh, plastics through biological feedstocks, managing refrigerants, and that's not just air conditioning, but it's uh, agricultural and industrial uses as well, or conserving water in our households. And of those four, uh, which ranks at the top? Well, here are the answers. In the, in, in, from, from, from the greatest to the least, it's refrigeration, water conservation, bioplastics and household recycling. And it's not just that you, you should be surprised that refrigeration is at the top, since that is what we're speaking to, but the magnitude of the potential is really staggering. Refrigeration is almost uh, 20 to 25 times greater than water conservation. And um, there's a reason for that. This is, we're thinking globally. And in doing that, the um, 
third world and, and the developing world wants to be like America and Europe and have all the advantages of our technologies and cooling is a central one. So the opportunity for refrigerant um, adoption worldwide is very great. The other aspect of it is, is the actual substances themselves. Now I was, I, Linda asked me not to bring all of my chemical uh, slides for compositions of the different, uh, the different substances. So I, I didn't, but, but the, here's the takeaway. Uh, in 1989, the uh, world got together through the Montreal Protocol to address ozone depletion and radically changed uh, the laws governing the production of refrigerants, phasing some of them out in just a matter of a couple of years, which was very hard on the HVAC industry. But uh, the industry responded very well. And then the, the compounds that weren't quite as harmful had a longer lead time for phase out. Well, we are just now entering the last year of production of R22, refrigerant 22, which is uh, hydrofluorocarbon. Uh, Notice the chloro, and that's chlorine because that was a chemical that destroyed the ozone. So we're getting rid of that. We've been phasing it down. We're at about 5% of the original production ceiling, and it will be gone next year, which leaves a real problem for uh, equipment that's about 10 years old or older if you wanna just put a little more gas in it to try and get through the season. You can't do that anymore. It's gotten too expensive and it's really not the right thing to do anyway. All leaks should be fixed, um, even the small ones. So R22 is going out. There's a lot of legacy equipment on people's, on, on all of our roofs and, and uh, in our yards that uses that substance. Um, any air conditioner ship prior to 2010 may be R22 based. If it was shipped prior to 2008, it almost certainly is. So now we're faced with the uh, issue of upgrading and changing, and there are some ways to change the refrigerant. But here's the good and the bad news. The good news is that since 2010, the compound that's been used is R410A, and it has no uh, ozone depletion potential. And typically those air conditioners due to codes and organizations like uh, the U.S. Uh, Green Building Council and their lead program, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, they are more efficient. So there's, a, there's typically a payback for changing out equipment. The other side of that, flip that coin, the bad news is R410A has the global warming potential on a molecule by molecule basis that's 2,200 times greater than CO2. This was a compound built for ozone depletion. This is, this is the reaction to that. We're, so what do we do to minimize that incredible impact on the environment? Well, we can't have leaks. We must have certified technicians who take care of the equipment and then at the end of its life, recycle it, uh, recycle the refrigerant, capture it and, and send it to a recycling center where they can use it again, but not let it get away to the atmosphere. That is essential. The re recommendation for commercial, uh, nonprofit uh, and, and church buildings is to be proactive about your HVAC. Know what you have. There are name tags on all of this stuff. If, if you can't read them, it's probably R22 because it's, it's older than 10 years. So know what you have. If you're keeping track of maintenance and maintenance activity and have a repair log on each individual unit, go to the front of the class because this will help you decide which units should be replaced or repaired. Um, there are certain drop-in refrigerants available, and in some cases, it may be worth making modifications to the unit rather than getting a new one. But the important part about being proactive is being able to make changes on your schedule and not on the equipment breakdown. If we run to failure, it's probably going to happen in July or August, and then um, your 
calling the contractor at his busiest time of the year to make a change, or you're doing without for a couple of months and, and uh, that's not pleasant either. So catalog what you have, understand the refrigerants that are in it and uh, address it appropriately. Okay, that's all for refrigerants, Dale. All right, um, then we're moving on to energy. And that, like I said, is the number number six. Um, it's it's topic number six here. I'm sorry, I'm reading the slide. Okay. Okay. Um, it's important to um, take care of your energy by again paying paying mind to it. Um, every energy bill has two aspects to it. Uh, and I'm thinking of electricity here. Um, and the electricity bill is measured in kilowatt hours, but for larger uh, commercial and industrial services, which most churches will qualify for in, in our area, there's also a thing called the demand charge. So easy way to think about that is to, to compare it to your car. The demand charge is your speedometer how fast are you going? And the energy charge uh, measured in the consumption charge measured in kilowatt hours is your odometer. So typically you think about the odometer and how far you went, but because elect electricity cannot be stored, the, the utility has to be able to supply it at a moment's notice. And they have to be able to supply it for everybody um, at equal voltage and frequency. So they have to overbuild their capacity so that they can meet that demand, that instantaneous KW draw. And um, in Arkansas, that demand is measured in a 15 minute window that can occur on any day of the week. And it will uh, can sometimes be as much as half uh, of the bill. So turning everything on at once on a Sunday morning, because there is no grace period, uh, that can create the demand spike that results in an abnormally high bill and um, something to be aware of. It will be on your energy bill and it's easy to track. If you use Portfolio Manager from, from EPA, a uh, very simple program, it's like filling out an experience sell spreadsheet right off of your utility bill, um, you'll be able to see all that information. Behaviors have a lot to do with it. We're awfully good at turning on lights and turning down thermostats in the summertime and forgetting to reset them back to where they were. Um, if you have programmable thermostats, most of the ones I've seen are usually on hold. Uh, get the program working, make sure that it uh, is in, in auto. Um, We've got great opportunities with lights. Uh, LEDs typically have paybacks in, in a couple to, to, to five years, depending on the type of bulbs that they're replacing. But perhaps as important as the energy for an LED is the bulbs last for thousands and thousands of hours, uh, 10 times longer than what we're used to in, in the old style uh, T12s and incandescents. So, they also uh, typically in the installation, the ballast will be removed from a fluorescent fixture uh, or at least wired around. And that saves um, another component that, that may fail at some point. So good paybacks for that. Good, good reasons to do it to save labor inside of your building. Okay. And my last slide. is good news. There is some good news here in, in all of this. A fellow named Ed Mazaria provided a keynote to the AIA a few years back. And what he looked at was the forecast by 2030 of how much energy we would need for our buildings. And when he looked at that in 2005, and at that time we were using 40 quadrillion BTUs 10 to the 15th, it's a huge number, uh, every year for buildings, residential and non-residential. And this is source energy. 
um, that 40 quadrillion BTUs was predicted by the Energy Information Administration to go to 60 quadrillion BTUs uh, by the end of the period, by 2030. So we would have to increase it by 50%. And that's the first line on the uh, first dot of information on this graph. As time rolled on, the EIA keeps making their predictions of how much we're going to have to have by 2030. Um, when they made the prediction in 2009, it was down to 45% increase. And when we got down to 2010, it was under 40%. So that the last prediction in 2015, it was actually a 7% increase. So this is due to uh, a lot of the efforts of groups like Arkansas Center for Power and Light, and especially USGBC with their lead rating system, and that being adopted by architects and engineers. It's due to improvements in code, um, ASHRAE 90.1, and building codes. So there's good, there is good news here. Um, Terry showed that in 2017, the source energy going to transportation crossed the source energy going to buildings or for electrical generation. And that's really remarkable because we change out our transportation infrastructure every 10 to 12 years. We change our building infrastructure every 50 to 100. So we can get busy. There's lots to do in buildings and, and, and across the economy. So there you go. Thank you. So one of the things uh, that I think goes along with that story, uh, I had a, a contract to look at the energy use by state buildings in Arkansas, and uh, uh, in about 2009, the state had a goal that they would reduce energy usage in state buildings by 15%, and they have met and surpassed that goal. Uh, before the deadline they had set for themselves, I was amazed. Um, and it's because the state has really gone in a big way with lighting improvements uh, and these serious upgrades to HVAC. Um, but it's also uh, the importance of the uh, reduction in the state uh, employment. We have fewer people working for the state of Arkansas than we have ever we have had in 15 years. And many, more, many of them who used to commute into an office are now have the flexibility to work from home. So you're cutting down both the transportation costs and the size of the building and the time that uh, state building is occupied. So good story there. So the, the one we want to jump back on now is water. Every church I've been in, and I looked all around this church while I was here last night setting up and uh, working in their kitchen, and there is a dripping faucet everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, there's a faucet that drips. And could we fix our own leaks before we do anything else? Uh, you know, a lot of times that's a washer. It costs uh, seven cents at Craftco, my local hardware store. Um, so uh, think about those. Uh, understand your use, both indoor and outdoor. If you don't have separate meters, most places, uh, the city require that now that you have those uh, separated on your meters. Uh, understand where you are. If you see an increase, pay attention to it. Um, we had a water leak in my at my house, and you know my uh, exterior meter went from a very small amount, pretty standard. Uh, to $200 a month. Oh my gosh, where's my water going? Well, it's just underground. I was losing it everywhere. Um, so you want to pay attention. When it comes time to replace a toilet in a church, please do it with one that's labeled with a water sense label. The price differential is, is minimal, uh, especially with a toilet that you're probably going to have in your facility uh, for at least 20 years, if not more. Um, You'd want to look at your dishwashers uh, when you replace those. Some churches have big commercial dishwashers. Some have little ones uh, more residential. But uh, you can get those that are energy labeled and save water too. 
Um, don't let your outdoor church sprinkler run in the rain. Please have a sensor so it knows when it's raining and it's not running in the rain. Uh, and then if you are in the process of thinking of a new building, uh, there are uh, technologies. You can see these at the Heifer International Headquarters where they're actually using gray water in the toilets. Um, that's something that's been in use at, at Heifer now for more than 10 years. Uh, the state health department allows that. Uh, in California, it's done all the time, but in Arkansas, we have a few places that put gray water in toilets, and Heifer's headquarters in Little Rock is a good example there. Oh, let me back up. If you have a church meeting and you have water pitchers and you have leftover water like we're going to have over there in water pitchers or water containers, how about water your plants with those rather than pour them down the drain? I mean, there's very simple things you can do. Uh, usually it's uh, those behavioral changes of your fellowship cleanup crew just knowing uh, a, maybe a different step than they've had before. So talking about waste, um, the importance in waste recycling, uh, churches generate an awful lot of paper, uh, mainly white paper uh, for worship bulletins, for mailed newsletters, for funeral programs, uh, for wedding programs. And you should have very visible ways to recycle as people leave either the sanctuary or the fellowship hall a large, colorful, visible container so that it reminds you as you are about to leave. Because if not, what, what happens? You, you stick your uh, worship bulletin in your uh, car and then it just gets thrown away, maybe not recycled. So please uh, have that happen right there at the church before you leave. And some of you have gone to e-newsletters or, or a combination of mailed and emailed newsletters. You need to each year offer that because people that have said, I still want mine in the mail uh, last year may be uh, more ready to move to that. So don't just think asking once every few years is enough. Every year ask. And as part of your new member format, you should be asking them, do you want something mailed to you or emailed? So let me ask. Does your church still mail a newsletter? Mine does, if you want it. Everybody else? Jenny, y'all have gone to all? All of it? Okay. All right. Well, see, so there's progress being made in this area. And that's uh, something interesting to ask uh, your church staff. Uh, are you using more or less white paper than you used to? Hopefully the answer is you've seen a good improvement there. So a zero waste event, we are showing you an example of that today with our different containers. Um, but because churches are often uh, meeting places for the public, whether that is a uh, uh, an AA type group or Boy Scouts or, or many other ways that churches open their buildings, um, you need to have some plans. You, so you need to have a plan for food scraps. Um, and there are services that do that, but there are volunteers that may be willing to set up a compost garden next door to the dumpster uh, beside the church parking lot where you could do that. Um, you should recycle your paper name tags at the exits if you need name tags. Uh, we've gone to permanent name tags at our church, and, and I think many people have, because the cost of making a $4 permanent name tag is just about up there with uh, writing a bunch of name tags every year. Um, and reducing your handouts. So today we are encouraging our speakers not to have handouts. Uh, I mentioned my name is at the bottom. If you want copies of presentations, I can email those to you. You need green purchasing guidelines. This, this ensures that that champion that you found at the beginning uh, that I mentioned, that, that's the, the champion of your environmental committee, when they either move, pass away, or get burnt out, uh, that, that you'll have some continuity in your church. And so one of the ways to make that happen is to actually write some policies, uh, either with um, your uh, governing board, like a, a elders or session, diaconate, 
or uh, just with the uh, church secretary who probably controls a lot of this. And so uh, guidelines like we will buy recycled paper with at least a 30% content. content. If you go to Office Depot, I looked uh, yesterday before I came. The difference in, uh, first I found no paper, uh, just copy paper at Office Depot that did not have a recycled content on the box. So that is a huge change. Um, second, those, the different levels of recycled content were minimal in cost. And so it's widely available and it's uh, out there for you to use. Um, and find those places to recycle your toners and your ink cartridges. You're probably printing less because why? You're doing more things electronically. Um, and then you need to have requirements uh, with your contractor or, uh, or architect if you're doing a renovation. Those are called the owner's requirements. And you can say, we want a carpet that has carpet squares. So if I spill coffee or paint or glitter on one square, I can replace it easily. But I want high recycled content in that carpet that you intend to replace in a room. Um, or I want low VOC paint. There's, there's all kinds of specifications that you can come up with there. And the major one that I have found mostly through my work with schools is to move towards water-based cleaners. Uh, there's so much asthma and allergies in our public schools right now uh, that one technique has become to go to polished concrete or very hard uh, flooring that does not require waxing and stripping at Christmas and in the summer with very harsh chemicals. Um, if you can use a water-based cleaner, a steam-type machine on your flooring and reduce your carpet, you've reduced the way that dust and allergy and mold can grow. So really, uh, more and more we're seeing this in schools, but um, the new youth building that I just built at my church, uh, you know, we went to a polished concrete floor uh, because first the youth are hard on it and second, uh, we are very concerned about the allergies in that room. And then reducing those plastics and styrofoam. Uh, what you need to do on your styrofoam, people say, well, well I got to have it for my coffee. People drink a lot of coffee at church. The AA groups are going to demand styrofoam is to pick a date and say, we will not have any more styrofoam purchased or paid for by a dollar of this facility. Church won't buy it. We will find alternatives. Um, I showed you what uh, Food Loops has, but you can buy that from uh, Sam's Club, from wherever you're getting your, your supplies. Cisco now offers uh, many good alternatives for coffee cups that are not styrofoam. The best being have every member of the church bring five mugs from home and leave them there because we've all got all these extra coffee mugs. We have a dishwasher at the church. You ought to be using real cups, real glasses, real silverware, real plates, and get rid of the disposables. But to do that, you have to just say, we intend to do it on this date, and here's why. Help us out, bring some cups from home, um, and uh, removing tablecloths is another one. We didn't put any tablecloths out here except for where we have our food. That's mostly to protect those tables. Um, and we are really trying in operations that, that I manage uh, and that your church can too is to look at ways to reduce the waste from those events. No plastic water bottles. Um, I'm offering many more of these nice Beaver Water District uh, water bottles. I bet I have 14 at home of various companies that have given me a water bottle. Donate those to the church. Encourage the church to have no plastic water bottles. Um, I'm very surprised. Even when our youth go on a trip now, we load up the big orange contractor type therm uh, thermos with water and the kids all bring a water bottle. So think about ways uh, to reduce the plastic at your church. That is uh, just about it. We've got about six minutes for questions. Are there things that you have done? Are there things you want to hear about more that uh, we might address? Questions, ideas? 
I can tell you that at my church, when we changed the interior lights out, uh, we got a substantial clear result rebate check. It was an investment on the part of the church, but we got money back. Uh, so we were able to plan to do that in, in one year. And then the following year, we did our parking lot lights and the exterior lights that are on the roof of the church um, that glow at night like a lighthouse. So uh, there are ways to do it. You may have to plan it on multiple years. Um, but Clear Result was our partner in that uh, and made it very worthwhile. Again, it was free for the audit. They gave us a nice written report, and we were able to then make plans of when we would accomplish uh, those change outs. Yes. That is uh, managed by the state health department. And you may have local building codes, but the state allows it. Uh, and so you just need to work through and push back a little bit on that. Um, they said no at Heifer uh, the first time they wanted to do it, and they were able to get that through. John has some feedback on that. It required, uh, the funny thing, if you've ever gone in the, this is the headquarters of Heifer, not the little building, but the tall building. They had to post a sign that says, do not drink the water in the toilets. <laughs> yes. Uh, but good, good use of gray water there to flush the toilets. So. More questions? Um, there are churches around Arkansas, and Interfaith Power and Light has played a key role in this, that are going towards solar. Uh, if you were in the early session, you heard about what this church has done. Uh, you see the windmill when you drive north to Springdale uh, with uh, the Episcopal Church there. Um, there are a number of churches in Little Rock that have small amounts of solar, maybe just for your main sign out front. I think that's a statement that you care uh, to put a, a little solar panel to light maybe just your sign at first. Uh, my church is, is going in a big way uh, with solar installation this summer um, that will offset the youth building, not the major part, but, but we're, we're taking steps to get there. Um, and I think uh, the nice thing about a church is you probably have wide space and not a lot of trees because your roof line tends to be taller than other buildings. You, you tend to have steeples, tall roofs, open spaces that allow you the opportunity for solar on your roof. But at my church, we have such an odd shaped roof, we're gonna do ground mounted solar. So we, we found some space uh, to do that. Um, other questions, comments, uh, good news stories? Yes. Yes. So that's where gray water can come from that you would collect. But there's also ways uh, with your, your good angled roof lines to collect water that you would then use for your uh, outdoor landscaping. I think that's the, the key thing is to put some uh, rain barrels, maybe even a larger cistern system um, in. And uh, then, uh, you know, as long as you raise it up, you know, 24 inches, you're going to have good flow out of the bottom of it, and you'll be able then to water uh, the facility that you have, uh, use it for plants and exterior landscaping. The, to minimize your, your storm water runoff, which, you know, most churches have pretty sizable parking lots, you should be thinking about ways uh, so that you are... Uh, having some of that uh, flow just to your storm drains disrupted. And the way to do that, of course, is permeable pavement. If you expand your parking lot, come on, let's think about ways that we're going to reduce the flow to your stormwater system. Um, in some uh, jurisdictions, there are actually incentives to do that. If you have found ways to reduce your stormwater runoff, your permitting uh, costs, uh, 
that may be a plus factor there. Okay, uh, we'll take a break. The next session starts um, in 10 minutes. You can uh, snacks, restroom, move around.